Good afternoon. Can we hear me okay? Yep, just come on. So welcome. Uh, this talk is not cool or hyped or fashionable at all. It's about modular monoliths. Yay. <laughs> Some background to this talk, right? So I'm on Twitter, and a, a number of years ago, I, I said this, you know, if you can't build decent monoliths, don't bother with microservices, because I saw a lot of people jumping on microservices, and they were just bound to fail. And I thought that was lots of wisdom, and so did 305 other people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> However, hold your applause, I got completely outclassed by the architect Clippy. I see you have a poorly structured monolith. Would you like me to convert it into a poorly structured set of microservices? Uh, 4,000. It's like a magnitude more. The other way to look at this is that. And that's essentially what this talk's all about. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Simon Brown. I am an independent consultant specializing in software architecture. I'm the author of a couple of software architecture books that you can find on leanpub.com. Uh, I also wrote a chapter in Uncle Bob Martin's Clean Architecture book recently. The chapter is called The Missing Chapter. It is there, because I do have a copy. And all of the stuff in The Missing Chapter is essentially what this talk is about as well. In addition to all of this stuff, I am the creator of the C4 model, which I'll explain in a second. But in a nutshell, it's a hierarchical set of architecture diagrams to describe software architecture systems. And I am the founder slash chief code monkey slash everything else of a company called Structurizer, which is a set of um, tooling to create architecture diagrams. Why do I bring these two things up? Uh, the first of all is the Structurizer stuff, the server side, is basically two Java Spring MVC web applications, two modular monoliths running on Pivotal Web Services Cloud Foundry platform. So all of the stuff I'm talking about in this talk, I'm actually using myself. Uh, we often call this dog fooding, which is a horrible term, but there we go. I'm not using Docker or Kubernetes or microservices or anything like that. So again, this is all old-fashioned stuff. And furthermore, if you have a good code structure, it's easy to visualize it. So that's kind of where I'm more interested in this modular monolith stuff from. C4. C4 is my uh, diagramming technique. It's context, containers, components, and code. And you can find more information about that at c4model.com. To give you a quick introduction, so this is a system context diagram for a system I built once upon a time. Basically, I built this thing here. It has different types of users and different system connections. We zoom into that system, and we show the containers inside it. By container, I mean application or data store. So here we can see that there's a web application, another Java application, and a bunch of data store things. We zoom into this content updater, this Java application, and we get to see the components inside that Java application. Again, it's nice and easy. It's all nice and hierarchical. You'll notice in the top right corner, there is a tweet component. Now, the tweet component, in this case, is just responsible for putting tweets into a Mongo data store and getting tweets out again. So this is level three of my C4 diagrams. So we zoom into this single box, the tweet component, and we get to see the code that implements it. Now, what have you noticed? Well, on the previous diagram, there was one box called tweet component. And now I've shown you the code. There is not one box called tweet component. It's gone. Tweet component does not actually exist. Where has it gone? The tweet component is actually a bunch of Java interfaces, in this case, and Java classes across a layered architecture. So we had this really nice, simple story unfolding. And then we've got to this final code level. The story stopped working. And it's at this point that people say, well, this doesn't actually matter because you know that tweet component exists conceptually. Yes, I guess so. I mean, it's a conceptual grouping of a bunch of Java interfaces and classes. But that's not the point here. The point here is that any abstractions we use to describe our software should reflect the code and vice versa. 
And that's essentially what this talk is all about. There's a great book about software architecture I'll, I'll refer you to called uh, Just Enough Software Architecture by George Fairbanks. In this book, George talks about what he calls the model code gap. So picture the scene you are at work, you're having an architecture discussion with your friends and colleagues, and during this discussion, you're going to be using words like module, component, service, subsystem, layer. Who's a Java developer here? A good chunk of you, excellent. So in Java, we often talk about building layered applications, yeah? Does Java have a layer keyword? Oh. Does Java have a component keyword? Not really. And that's the problem. The languages that we use, and this applies to most other languages as well, the languages we use do not have these architectural constructs as first-class citizens, as first-class keywords. And this is the model code gap. So we talk about a module or a service or a layer, and if you can't map these concepts into the code base, there's a mismatch, isn't there? A mismatch between these two ways of thinking, bottom-up versus top-down. This is the model code gap. The other way to think about this is, imagine I ask you to draw me an architecture diagram of your software, you will probably draw me a quite high-level picture. Modules, components, layers, services, etc., and how they interact at runtime. If I were to find some tooling to reverse engineer a diagram from your actual code base, I'm not going to get the same diagram, am I? I'm going to get a very low-level, very precise diagram showing me classes, interfaces, folders, files, namespaces, package hierarchies, and so on. Again, this is potentially the model code gap. The model, for the, the model code gap manifests itself in a number of different ways. One of these is very simply this. You go and ask organizations, show me your architecture diagrams, and they, they have these wonderful looking, very colorful architecture diagrams sometimes. And then you ask the development team, do these make sense? And they go, no, because they don't match our code. And this happens a lot. And that's the thing I want to try and fix here as well. In the book, George Fairbanks says one of the ways we can address this model code gap is to adopt an architecturally evident coding style. Now, this sounds very grand, but basically it's just saying that the code structure should reflect the architectural intent. So there's a nice clean mapping between how we think about our system from a kind of top-down perspective and what the code ends up looking like and being structured. So this brings me on to how do we structure code, and of course there are lots of different ways to do this. So I'm gonna walk through a bunch of the more common ways to organize, in this case, Java code, but a lot of what I'm gonna talk about applies to many other languages as well. The first of these is called package by layer. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to organize code based upon what it does from a technical perspective. So hopefully you've seen this a million times before. This is a, a typically a horizontal style of um, slicing of packaging, of layering. And you end up with code bases looking like this. So imagine we are building a web application doing something with orders. You might have some sort of web layer up here, an orders controller doing webby stuff. You might have some business service thing here, like an orders service, and then you might have some data stuff at the bottom. All familiar with this? Good. You've got different types of layered architectures. You've got the relaxed versus strict approaches to layering. Uh, the difference is essentially how many levels, how many layers down can you call? Do you call just the, directly, uh, just the layers directly beneath you, or can you skip around layers? This is the, the difference between strict and relaxed. Why do we do this? Or why have we done this? And the answer is everybody tells us to. So you go and read a book on Spring in this case, and it says, yeah, organize your code like this, and it's a bunch of layers. You turn the page over, it tells you why, separation concerns, testability, et cetera, et cetera. Additionally, sample code bases. Every time you download a sample code base for some new framework, they typically are structured in a nice, easy way to understand, typically layered architectures. Um, 
any demos you see at conferences, are typically layered architectures as well, and so on and so forth. There's something called cargo cult programming, which you may have um, come across before. And basically, this is doing stuff because you think you should, but you don't really know why. And I think layered architectures and, and structuring our code as a set of layers falls into this category a number of times. And we often don't think very carefully about why we're doing this. We, we just kind of do it because we think we should, because that's how everybody else does this. Uncle Bob Martin, a number of years ago, wrote this great blog post called Screaming Architecture. And he basically said, if you look at most enterprise code bases, they all look the same. Web stuff, business stuff, data stuff. And that's typically reflected in the top level structure of the folders and packages and namespaces and code elements. And he says, this is not the way that the building world works. So if you look at the set of blueprints for a library or a house or a museum, you can tell it's a library or a house or a museum just by looking at the blueprints. And so this leads us on to something else. Martin Fowler said a similar thing as well. He said this layered architecture, this layered code structuring, is a good way to start. It's nice and easy. It's easy to explain to people. However, once you get to scale your product, to scale your project, you now have to start thinking about modularity inside the layers. So rather than chopping your code up like this, maybe you need to chop it up a, uh, in a different manner. The other thing to bear in mind here is if you do have a layered architecture, like you're building a web application, and you want to add a field to a web page, you end up changing stuff in the web page, and then in web controller stuff, and then the biz, uh, in the business or service layer, and also in the data layer. So many changes that we make to our software systems actually go across all layers anyway. So a layered architecture is not a particularly good or efficient way to structure code as well, from those perspectives. Alternative approaches. Number two, package by feature. So this is basically flipping the whole thing 90 degrees. And rather than organizing our code and grouping our code by technical thing, we're now doing it by functional thing. Feature set, aggregate roots. There are a number of ways we can slice our code base up vertically, if you want to say that. How you do this is, of course, entirely up to you. But it is that vertical slicing. So we're grouping together things related to a certain feature set or aggregate root, for example. This is what it might look like. So rather than having our orders functionality split across web packages, business packages, data packages, we throw it all together in a single orders package. Is this better than package by layer? Debatable, it's just different. One of the cited benefits includes it being it's easier to find code related to orders. I guess so, because it's all in one place. However, with modern IDEs, you can use searching. So a lot of these arguments are not that great, to be honest. You do get higher cohesion, because all of your order stuff is in one place now. One of the big problems with this way to structure code is that if you have orders and customers, and you need to have a link between the two, where do you make that link? So there are some interesting side effects and caveats to a package by feature, for example. Sometimes when I poll audiences and I say, you know, who does package by layer, and nobody says anything, and I say, uh, who does package by feature, and a few more hands go up, and then you ask, who does ports adapters, and many more hands go up. And this seems to be a, a much more common approach to structuring monolithic applications these days. So by ports and adapters, essentially what you're trying to do here is you're trying to keep your domain-related business code separate from your technical or infrastructure-related code. And the way this works um, is that there's an inside and an outside. And there are a number of different approaches and themes on basically this core central idea. Um, some of them you may have heard of before, hexagonal architectures, clean architectures, onion architectures, and so on and so forth. So you have an outside, which is 
about your technology and your interfaces with the outside world, and you have an inside which is about your business domain. So the inside is technology agnostic. For those of you familiar with domain-driven design, you're typically expressing the concepts on the inside in terms of that DDD ubiquitous language. So customers, orders, products, etc. And the outside is the text-specific stuff. So when you're writing interfaces and adapters to databases and external parties and APIs, that's where that code lives. And there's one rule here, essentially. The outside depends on the inside, never the other way around. So it looks like this. You have your domain stuff in the middle, your infrastructure, on the outside, infrastructure stuff on the outside, and all the dependency arrows point inwards. And this is what it might look like from a kind of class diagram perspective in Java. So this package here represents the domain stuff on the inside, and the arrows, again, point inwards. I suspect that this approach to structuring code is also cargo culted a lot. And one of the reasons I say this is because not all frameworks are created equal. And what I mean by this is it's easier to wrap up some frameworks and some interactions with the outside world than others. So imagine you are building a web application, and your web application has 100 different pages that you display to the user. You have to basically create 100 adapters and wrappers, one per page, essentially. If all of your 100 pages end up talking to three or four tables in a database, it's easier to wrap up three or four tables on a database than provide uh, wrappers and adapters into 100 web pages. So you have to be careful about um, taking ports and adapters at face value, because you might end up writing lots of adapter code and abstraction code that's not really necessary. I have seen people, for example, wrap up frameworks like Spring MVC. So Spring MVC kind of sits in this outside, and then they add additional abstractions on top of Spring MVC to make sure that their domain code is not dependent upon Spring MVC. And if you're thinking that's nuts, it is, because Spring MVC already provides a nice, simple abstraction over HTTP. So you're kind of wrapping up the wrapping up the wrapping up. So just basically be careful with this is what I'm saying. Having said all of this, all right, so let's go back to our simple layered, exa uh, layered example. So we have this code. We have web stuff, business stuff, data stuff. And you have a nice big system, thousands of lines of code, it's all working great. Somebody new joins your team. And you say, oh, hello. I've got a great feature, nice introductory feature. It's not too tricky. I'd like you to add it to the code base. The new person comes along. They download or copy the source code. They have a look through the source code. They try and figure out what's going on. And they say, yeah, I think I know how to add this feature. And they take this, and they do that. Yeah. This might be the best way to implement that feature, or it might not. And maybe you had a principal on your team that says, make sure we have a strict layered approach and we don't start bypassing layers. But if you didn't tell that to your new joiner, they might do that because they think it's more efficient. And if left unchecked, you get that happen. <laughs> One of the problems with languages like Java is that what people typically do is, you know, this might be a Java package, and this might be a separate Java package. In order for this thing to talk to this thing in a separate package, this thing has to be public. Once this thing is public, it can be called from here, but it, also, it can also be called from anywhere else in your code base. You see the same with uh, C Sharp and the internal key work, um, for, for example. So. Again, you do have to be a bit careful here. And this is what we typically get to, the big ball of mud. It's a haphazardly structured system. And I love this bit, dictated more by expediency. So when you're in a hurry to add stuff to your code base, yeah, we'll do the things the quickest way we possibly can. And maybe that's not good for the long-term structure of your code base, the longevity of your code base. 
So it's at this point somebody says, well, hang on a second. We don't really do this in the real world because what we have on our team is a set of architectural principles. And these architectural principles allow us to introduce constraints and guidelines and boundaries. And through these architectural principles, people won't make those shortcuts. And these architectural principles typically say stuff like that. So web controllers should never talk to data access repositories directly. They all always go through these services layer. Have you seen these sorts of principles in use? Yeah. And then you ask people, how do you enforce this? And their faces go blank. And they go, oh, I know how to answer this question. We trust our developers because we're agile. Yes. And how does that work out for you? And in some cases, this works beautifully. Right? Don't get me wrong. There are definitely teams I've worked with who can do this, and they're fantastic. For the rest of us, yeah, we're all human. And if we need to move fast, we might start taking some shortcuts. And if we're on the scrum train, and we're trying to sprint, 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 deliver, 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 we might take more shortcuts than we perhaps really should do. And then we get a few weeks in, and we go, oh, we need a refactoring sprint because our code base is a bit of a mess now. Sorry. So this is the stuff you have to watch out for. It is, however, 2018. And given it is 2018, and we have all this machine learning and AI stuff, we should be able to build some tooling that helps us build well-structured code bases. In other words, we should be able to use tools that help us create nicely structured code bases. Does anybody do this? It's like one person going, yeah, a little bit. This is not a common thing. There's a, a book that was released um, recently called Building Evolutionary Architectures. Uh, and in that book, they talk about fitness functions. And fitness functions, um, they're quite broad in nature, and you can use them for asserting quality attributes, um, scalability, performance, security, that sort of thing as part of your build process. You can also use fitness functions as a way to assert something about the fitness of your code base. So cyclomatic complexity, um, coupling, and so on and so forth. And one of the ways to do this, of course, is to use tooling. And there are a number of tools out there that can help you create some fitness functions that run assertions on how good or bad, objectively, uh, your code is. Static analysis tools, um, and you have a bunch of architecture violation checking tools. So I'm thinking about things like uh, JQ Assistant that you can write rules with, Arc Java, Arc Unit, and so on and so forth. And what you can do with these tools is you can start to define rules that look a bit like this. So it's the same thing as the architectural principles. You know, types in star star slash web, our, our web package, should not have access to star star slash data, stuff in our data access package. Then you integrate these things with your build process, and hopefully somebody does something silly, your build breaks. And then you turn this rule off because it's annoying. But that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, we all do that, right? At ignore test. I do kind of like this idea because this, this gets us a bit better than where we are today. However, it feels like a horrible hack. So we have to write a bunch of external tooling to verify the actual tooling we're building is of a decent quality. Uh, and that just doesn't really sit well with me because we can turn it off. So what's the answer? And the answer is, maybe we need to get better at using the tools we have available to us today. Like the compiler. And it's at this point people will ultimately say, well, hang on a second, if you're talking about you know, Java and using the compiler and access modifiers, Java's flawed. And you say, why is Java flawed? And they'll give you all of the reasons why Java is flawed from a kind of access modifier perspective. You know, we don't have, so if you, if you have a package, there's no kind of sub package thing in Java. Uh, and you, you very quickly get to explore the different flaws of the Java packaging system and access modifiers and things like this. 
and that's fair to an extent. However, that's what we have. And unless you want to go and write new languages that have first-class keywords like layer and service and components, then maybe we should just try and figure out how to use what we've got now. So with this in mind, I have another option for you. And this option is, is what I call package by component. And it's really a kind of hybrid approach to package by layer and package by feature. And what I'm really trying to do here is I'm trying to bundle together all of the code that belongs to a component in the same place. What do I mean by components? Because this is a horribly, hugely overloaded term. What I mean by component is essentially this. It's a grouping of related functionality, hopefully behind a nice, clean, simple interface. And this component runs inside something like an application. If you're wondering where this came from, it comes from the abstractions behind my C4 diagram model. So a software system is made up of containers, not Docker, but applications and data source, so apologies. Containers contain components. Components are built from code elements. So what I'm trying to do essentially is get the architecture view of the world to marry up with the code structure and the code view of the world. And package by component basically looks like this. So my personal preference here, and, and there are different ways to do this, but my personal preference is always to keep the kind of UI-related stuff, whether that's web UIs or APIs, separate from the non-visual stuff. So if I'm building some orders functionality, there's an orders controller doing orders web stuff, and there's a whole bunch of non-visual orders-related functionality. So business service stuff, business logic, and data access. So this whole thing I'm going to call an order component. What I'm trying to do here is essentially apply component-based thinking to a monolithic code base. So this is good old-fashioned component-based thinking, component-based design applied to monolithic code bases. And what I'm trying to do here essentially is apply modularity as a guiding principle to a lot of the architectural and therefore code structure decisions I end up making. So I'm always thinking, what are the big coarse-grained things that I would like my system to be made out of? What are the high-level structural building blocks, essentially, of my monolithic application? The other way to look at this is basically I'm separating interface from implementation. This is another good old-fashioned design technique. Interestingly, this is exactly what we see with microservices, isn't it? So with package by component, I'm going to have some sort of interface, some sort of public Java interface, and a whole bunch of package-protected implementation code. With a microservice, I'm going to have, again, some sort of public interface, JSON over HTTPS, messaging, whatever, some sort of network public API, and a whole bunch of private implementation code that you can't see inside of. So if I have an orders microservice, you can't call my data layer inside the orders microservice because it's hidden behind the public API. The same thing is true of what I'm trying to do with package by component. So I might have a bunch of classes and interfaces inside, inside my Java components, but you can't get access to this because I'm going to use Java's package protection mechanism and hide it from the outside world. So this is one component per Java package. It's about putting some boundaries, some impermeable boundaries around my code. So this is all very easy to do. Hooray. But the devil is in the implementation details. So you can come all the way through this story and have a bunch of really nice ideas about how you want to structure your code base. And then it all falls down that last hurdle. And you end up with a big ball of mud, and you don't really know how that happened. And the reason it often happens is because of our friend, the public keyword. The number of times, even, even literally like last week, I went through some of my own code, and I was reading it, and I was like, this thing does not need to be public. Delete. We just type public by default, and I don't know why. It's muscle memory. 
A lot of the tooling we use, you know, IDEs, you go through wizards and they create you a bunch of public classes. It's like, stop doing that. It's just stop using the public keyword. It's not necessary half the time. What's the problem with the public keyword? There's a big difference between organizing code and encapsulating code. And the problem with using the public keyword is you're really missing out on many of the benefits related to encapsulation. Right, these two concepts are very, very different. I've given you four examples of some orders related functionality. Number one, package by layer. Number two, package by feature. Number three, ports and adapters. Number four, my package by component approach. If we take these four simple examples, and we assume that all of those interfaces and classes are made public. So again, this is, has a Java slant, but you can apply this to other languages. If we, if we make the assumption all of these types in the examples are public, you get four versions of the same thing that are very conceptually different. So they're conceptually different architectural styles and structures, but they're actually syntactically identical. So here are the four examples laid out side by side. Packaged by layer, packaged by feature, ports and adapters, packaged by component. If we make the assumption that all of these types in these packages are public, all we are using these packages for is organization. They're like folders. We have no encapsulation going on here whatsoever. So if we remove these packages, from these class diagrams, you get that. They're all the same. That's a neat trick, isn't it? This goes a long way to, to explaining how sometimes when I look at, say, a ports and adapters code base, it looks like a layered architecture. And often it is because, look, all the arrows match up. You're just dumping public classes in different packages, but there's no encapsulation there. So you have to be super careful with the use of the public keyword. We have access modifiers in Java and other languages. So if we use the access modifiers appropriately, we can start to draw some very different pictures. So I'm going to bring back the packages onto this diagram, and I'm going to fade out, I'm going to gray out the implementation types that could potentially be made Java package protected and therefore hidden outside that package. You kind of have to work this through in your head. So in the layered architecture example, this orders controller needs access to this order service. So the service interface needs to be public. The implementation class can actually be package protected. If you're wondering how do you instantiate a package protected class, Ask Spring, it'll do it for you. In order for this service implementation class to use this orders repository, the interface needs to be public. Implementation class can again be package protected. With package by feature, you need some sort of public entry point into that package, and everything else can be hidden from the outside world. Assuming no other slice needs access to stuff in this orders package. With the ports and adapters architecture, that thing, again, needs to be made public because it's accessible by the outside world. This interface needs to be made public. The implementation class can be package protected. And this interface needs to be public because it's, it's dependent upon by this potentially package protected implementation class sitting outside. In, port, in my package by component, again, that thing is just public. And we have a public interface here and a bunch of package protected implementation code. So now you can see that actually layered architectures and ports adapters are not that different depending on how you look at them, whereas these other two um, versions are quite different. And that's the thing. It's always worth having some extra thinking time uh, and making sure that the way you actually implement and structure your code matches back to how you intend your architecture to look from a top-down perspective. And one of the things I think you should do here is use encapsulation and really use encapsulation to minimize the number of potential dependencies. If you have a code base and everything is public, everything can be called from everything else. 
and you get lots of potential dependencies. Once you start hiding code and using information hiding and encapsulation, you can only have dependencies on public things. The fewer public things you have, the fewer potential dependencies you can have. And the other way to look at it is this. The surface area of any internal public APIs should match your architectural intent. So if you have an architecture diagram that has a set of components or modules in layers, make sure your code reflects that, so that people can't bypass what you consider to be a module or a component and start accessing internals directly. So basically what I'm saying here is if you are building a monolithic application, you do have some options here to use a compiler to enforce some of your architectural boundaries and your architectural ideas and intent. This is like the simple version of the whole story. Because once you kind of take these ideas, you can go, you can go a number of steps further. And there are other ways to decouple code elements. For example, you can use a module framework, like the, the new slash old Java 9 module framework that people are not using yet. The Java module framework allows you to distinguish public types from published types. So you can write your entire code base as a bunch of public types. And when you create your module manifest, you only export and publish a specific subset of those types. If anybody tries to use your public types that are not published, they can't do that. So there are module frameworks out there that allow you to, uh, again, create this distinction, this to decouple interface from implementation. You could also go further and split your source tree into multiple parts. So multiple Maven modules, gra uh, gra Graven, I always say Graven, Gradle modules, and so on and so forth. So you have one source code tree per thing, per module, per layer, whatever. You do have to be careful with this. If you are doing ports and adapters, you know, having separate source trees is, I think, a recommended approach. Because one of the anti patterns I see with ports and adapters style architectures is you have two code bases, one for the stuff in the middle and one for everything else around the outside. So you have like a domain source tree and an infrastructure source tree. And the problem with doing this is if you have one source tree with all of your infrastructure code, it's very easy for infrastructure code to talk to each other. So again, if you slice your ports and adapters uh, code structure into multiple code trees, you can stop this thing happening at compile time, for example. The problem with doing this is there are lots of trade-offs. Because the more source trees you have, the slower and more complicated your build process gets. So there's probably some sweet spot, depending on what it is you're building and the size and complexity of the thing you're building. More generally, of course, um, every decoupling mode has different trade-offs. And this is where we actually get back to microservices again. Because microservices is, if you like, the ultimate decoupling mode, isn't it? Rather than having a bunch of code kind of sitting in the same process with some boundaries around it, you've got separate processes with essentially networks in the way. So that's the ultimate decoupling mode. But there are a bunch of trade-offs associated with doing that. And this raises a, a rather tricky question. How do you know what style of architecture suits you? Do you go for a monolith, or do you go for microservices? And unfortunately, I see lots of people jumping on microservices for reasons around fashion and hype. And they're failing. This is what George Fairbanks, again, in his book, calls architecture in different design. So choosing an architecture, choosing the style just because, why not? And not really thinking through the trade-offs and the caveats about, uh, about that particular architectural choice. One of the things I recommend people do is use agility as a quality attribute. So quality attributes are things like performance and scaling and availability and so on. What about agility? So how fast do you need to move as a team? And which parts of your code base, which parts of your system need to move fast? Which parts of your code base are potentially more volatile than others? And maybe you use this information as a way to make a much more informed decision. So maybe you have the bulk of your code in a monolith and a bunch of smaller services around the edge that need that volatility or that need to be able to change with that volatility, rather. And in all, all of this, a good architecture gives you agility. And again, this kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you've ever seen those big, horrible code bases, the big balls of mud, the spaghetti code systems, 
When you change something here, a whole bunch of stuff here breaks, and you don't know why, and it slows you down. A good architecture gives you agility. What do I mean by a good architecture? This is somewhat subjective, but what I mean by a good architecture is something with high modularity. It's something that has a good, well-defined structure. And one of the problems here is you don't get that for free. So you have to put some upfront thinking, let's call it upfront design, to come to a nice, well-defined structure. And this is one of the reasons why people jump on microservices, because microservices gives you a strategy for decomposition and modularity. It's a bunch of separate processes running around on your network. So people use microservices architectures to enforce code boundaries. And in many of the conference talks, certainly over the past few years, you always find people comparing this thing to these things down here, these horrible monolithic big balls of mud. And that's really unfair. I mean, historically, monolithic applications have looked like this. I would definitely grant you that. But this is a really unfair comparison, because what I see a lot of people doing is they say, we have one of these, and we've been building one of these for 10 or 15 years, and it is a mess. And we can't change. It's just too slow to add features now. So what we're going to do is rewrite it from scratch in that style. I can see people going, no, really? Yeah, I've had a number of organizations I've spoken to this year who basically told me this, this exact story. And what they unfortunately end up doing is they end up taking their approach to building that, and they stick, typically, synchronous HTTPS calls between the things in the monolith. And they end up with that. <laughs> and furthermore, all of this has to be lockstep deployed. But hey, we're doing microservices on Docker and Kubernetes. <laughs> CV-driven design. Uh, so yeah, basically, they end up with a, uh, a distributed version of what they had before, which is really poorly performing, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a much fairer comparison. Um, I would like people to maybe just do this first. <laughs> so. As I've described to you during this talk, it is possible to create modular monoliths. You have to put a bit of thinking into this. You have to make sure that your code structure reflects your architectural ideas and intent. And again, you use agility as a quality attribute. Maybe you have most of your features in that thing, and you have a bunch of services floating around the edge where that makes sense. There's a slightly harder part of all of this I'm going to skip over, and that is actually doing design. <laughs> And people say, well, how do you design software? I'm like, we've done this before. Go look at Wikipedia. And you show them the page about decomposition, like, oh, that's interesting. Yes. <laughs> and you tell them that there are different ways to decompose a thing into smaller things. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that either. And it, it, it appears that we've lost the ability to describe how we actually do design. Like, people just do design, but they can't tell you the underlying principles about how they do design. You know, whether it's functional decomposition or volatility-based decomposition, and so on and so forth. And then whenever you go to a microservices talk these days, people end up talking about Parnas. And they end up showing a screenshot of this paper, and they, they cross out the word module on, and, and you know, throw service or microservice in there. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that we've learned in the past. This is from the 70s. Really interesting paper. You should definitely read it. And there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff in the past about good design and high cohesion and low coupling and responsibilities and volatility, and we've just forgotten it all. And all of this stuff applies to every type of software system we should ever be building. A good architecture gives you agility. A good structure gives you agility. And then people ask you, well, how do we even get to a set of things? And you say, again, there's more techniques out there. Go learn them. So something called CRC. It's an old workshopping technique used to be quite um, well used around the kind of RUP era, Russia Unified Process, fell out of fashion. It has class in the name, classes, responsibilities, collaborators. It's a workshopping technique for doing class level design. We don't do class level design in, in meetings anymore. But you take this approach, and you scrub out this first word, and you make it component, or module, or microservice. And you get the same approach. You get the same collaborative design approach applied at a high level of abstraction. So you get good at design. You get good at design. You throw stuff into a monolith first. Once you're happy with your design and your decomposition approach in the monolith, 
Then you take stuff out into microservices world if you need to. Right, so microservices architectures do provide a bunch of benefits. Agility, scalability, resilience, and so on, so on, so on. But this is way harder to deal with. More moving parts, automatic provisioning, monitoring, log aggregation. You're also paying more as well. So one of the reasons I brought up Structurizer right at the start is because it's a startup. As a single person startup, I want to deliver stuff quick. I don't want to be spending months messing around with Docker, Kubernetes, log aggregation frameworks, and all this stuff. I just want to throw stuff on the web and get people using it. So Structurizer is two modular monoliths. I don't have to deal with all of this stuff yet, but I could do if I wanted to. So yeah, choose microservices if they give you benefits. Not because your code base is a mess now, because that's not going to fix any problems, of course. Whatever approach you do go for, whether it is a modular monolith or a set of microservices, um, don't forget about the implementation details. So definitely be aware of this overuse of the public keyword, for example, when you're building monolithic applications. And definitely be aware of the model code gap. So if you have a bunch of architecture diagrams, make sure they match your code. And that is basically that. Thank you very much.